Hello and welcome to today's video and once more I am going to be talking about economics. Although uh, this is of course being a history channel so it's economics in history but also to understand what is happening today and where current events uh, are placed in history. So oligarchs, where do they come from? Well let's have a little look back in history. So. In the communist system, uh, it's a system where uh, obviously people still have to eat and they still need things such as tools and cars and food and all the rest of it and somebody has to produce them. In a, uh, in, in a capitalist system, these are produced by private companies who uh, work on the principle of supply and demand. And if it's a private company, then you need to have somebody who knows what they're doing, doing the job. That's not how it works in a uh, communist or socialist type system. Indeed, uh, it's the, I am utterly in favour of privatisation, just about everything, just about everything. I didn't say absolutely everything. There's one or two things which are uh, where privatisation may not make much sense, such as in uh, health service, for example. But uh, in industrial things, I think in privatisation is the only way to do it because you get experts on people who know what they're doing. Now, uh, in a communist system, what you, what you get is that somebody who was an apparatchik, uh, somebody who worked their way up through the party, ends up doing the, uh, getting these plum jobs, despite the fact they may have no idea how to do them. It's a bit like, for example, if I were a communist and I wanted to be a footballer, then they'd put me on uh, the, the on a Saturday afternoon playing against Chelsea, for example. Uh, so that wouldn't be a particularly good idea, but that is exactly how it worked in the Soviet Union in an industrial sense. For example, even here in Poland, and okay, Poland is a democratic country, but in uh, 2001, the, um, the Left Democratic Alliance, Soyuz Lewica Demokratyczna, won the elections and the head of that party who became the Prime Minister, Leszek Miller, he said that we won the elections, therefore we will choose who runs the uh, government-owned companies. And um, that doesn't work very well. For example, the current situation here in Poland, when the, the current lot won in 2015, they put uh, their own party apparatchiks in, in major positions. People had no experience of business or whatsoever, and the result was absolutely forecastable. And there were major losses as a result. However, the apparatchik in getting uh, uh, money, uh, large sums of money, the money of a director, uh, or uh, manager, whatever, that's how that person is rewarded for their political loyalty. So, uh, people like, for example, even the likes of Molotov or Kaganovich, uh, who, when they lost their jobs within the uh, central committee of the Communist Party, ended up running, for example, a potash mine, even though he hadn't got a clue how to run the potash mine. Having said that, I'd rather run, they were running a potash mine than running country. That apart, not the subject of this little talk. So, uh, in the uh, Soviet Union, all business, uh, almost all business, was in uh, state hands. Now, in 1990, Gorbachev took steps to actually uh, start to create the possibility of changing uh, into uh, companies into the, where, where they could be privatized and there was a certain amount of privatizations which happened in the uh, first half of the 1990s. Now we need to have a little bit of uh, politics. In 1996 the uh, presidential election in Russia was due to be held. Uh, it was every five years. Yeltsin won in 1991 and so he was up for re-election and his uh, approval ratings, uh, as I recall, were in single figures. It looked as though uh, uh, Gennady Zhuganov, the communist uh, leader, was going to be the new president. Indeed, he turned up the uh, World Economic uh, Forum in Davos in 
March, I think it was February or March 1996, and he was treated as though he was going to be the new leader of uh, Russia. Uh, in order to stop this potential problem, clearly Yeltsin needed a great deal of help. Not only did he need help from the, from the political side, but he also needed it from the economic side. Russia had major economic problems. However, what it did have was uh, huge state-owned concerns which had a fortune in assets. And a group of people largely uh, from uh, one bank, which we'll come on to, uh, decided that, why don't we do the following? That uh, some companies and private individuals can um, loan money to the state, and the state will pay it back, but if it fails to pay its obligations, then um, the, these uh, shares, which were the guarantee of being paid, pay, of payment, will then become the property of the, the new owners. This is called loans for shares. And uh, this is the beginning of uh, what would uh, be the oligarchs. Now, um, this, in my opinion, uh, in principle, it sounds like a pretty good idea. Well, or does it? It didn't work at all because of the way it was corrupt, corruptly uh, administered. Now, the problem was this, if um, the, the best way of privatization would have been to give companies which knew what they were doing experts. Now, for example, if uh, the oil sector had been uh, privatized, or even in part privatized to companies like uh, BP, Shell, uh, Texaco, and all the rest of them, uh, then the benefits would be the following, is that the state would raise a stack of cash. These companies are, do have uh, corporate governments, governance, although I would accept that you may say, oh, well, look at what they're doing in Nigeria, some of them. Um, but uh, they, they do pay taxes uh, in, and they uh, stick to the law. But, and they certainly wouldn't be uh, siphoning off huge sums of money uh, or, or, and, and the assets into uh, tax havens abroad. At least, not, not saving a little bit, but not huge, huge amounts. The, the, um, however, it was decided for nationalist reasons that they can't allow this. These um, they must stay in Russian hands. They must... So, uh, in these Russian hands they stayed in were the oligarchs. Now, um, just a, I've got a, a quote here actually from the New York Times, and this is from 1996, and uh, which I'm now going to give to you. So, bear in mind that the, the year this was written. So, what they did was they had auctions, but the auctions were fixed. And so it's like uh, you and me, sort of, we, we come to an agreement that we're going to bid and I'm going to stop anybody else from bidding. And so therefore, uh, we'll get the lowest price possible. We'll share the proceeds between the two of us and, uh, and, and, um, and knowing full well that the state won't be able to do anything for it. So here's the New York Times. When the auctions began last fall, it became all too obvious that a fix was in. Foreign investors were barred from bidding for the most desirable assets and the same banks that were signed by the government to organize the auctions ended up winning them and usually at only a fraction over the minimum bank. Our next bank, for instance, organized the auction of 38% of Norilsk nickel, which produces platinum and a quarter of the world's nickel, and won it for $171 million, only $100,000 above the minimum bid, and half as much as the rival Rossiski Credit Bank was prepared to pay. Sorry, Rossiski Credit Bank. Our Exim Bank spokesperson said that they disqualified Rossiski uh, credit. Sorry, I got that wrong. It's Rossiski credit. I can't, you know, I've got my glasses on. I can't read it probably. Rossiski credit uh, because it filed its applications late and wanted to guarantee its bid with treasury bills as well as cash. Rossiski Bank said it would sue. Anyways, that's a, that's a quote from uh, to, to give you an idea. So you've got Ross, uh, Onexim Bank is deciding who can bid and who can't bid and then they put their own bid in and um, 
the owner of uh, that bank is a now a mate he's still he's super wealthy he's the same person and uh, he um, 61 years old now and he's spent half of his life living in the luxury of this fraudulent uh, bid uh, that, that, that was made so the money which I wouldn't say stolen but it was in a way defrauded from the Russian um, Russian taxpayer now one thing that happened uh, obviously is if you're going to uh, make a bid uh, for 171 million for something which it may be worth uh, billions and billions of dollars but you still got to have the 171 million uh, so if you imagine you've got a situation like uh, Sibneft which if memory serves me correctly had assets of around six billion dollars which was purchased for a hundred million or something like that you still got to find the hundred million uh, up, up, up front. So where did where did this money come from? So there were a number of people who made money in the early nineties, and some of them did it uh, honestly, and others uh, didn't. Now, uh, for example, one of the schemes with the ideas was now if something's nationalised, it belongs to us. It's our property. So uh, as things, there were these privatisation vouchers, and these were given to lots of people. Um, even even miners could get these privatisation vouchers. The problem with the privatisation vouchers was that people didn't understand, didn't know what they were. They could exchange them for something else, which might be worth something. Maybe they need to fix the car, so they exchange the privatisation vouchers, or maybe they want to get a few drinks, so they change change the, their vouchers. And in this way, these vouchers came into the hands of. Uh, a very few uh, people. For example, uh, again, I'm going to quote now from Poland. Uh, one of the things that privatization vouchers was there's a priest who called Ridzik, who's uh, on the extreme right, uh, and he sort of took the private. He asked people to send them. They didn't even have to buy them. He took them, and uh, he collected the proceeds. So, uh, and this is in Russia, okay. Um, as I understand it, uh, they were mainly purchased, but they purchased for a fraction of their value. So there were some people who managed to earn money very, very quickly by uh, doing things things of this nature. And other people I know, for example, one of the people that got involved in import-export or even uh, banking or uh, IT or, or things of this nature. And it was using these contacts where they are able to get the cash. Some of them actually even raised the cash uh, from partners abroad. So uh, now that uh, they've got the guarantees uh, of, uh, for the loans, what happened? Well, Yeltsin won the election. He won it reasonably decisively, I would say. As, as, uh, the communists got just over 40% and Yeltsin uh, was, what, about 50, 58, something like that in the second, second round. In Russia, the, uh, there's, like, like in France, for example, there's anybody can stand in the first round and in the second round uh, there's just the, the first and second people who got the first and second amount of votes so uh, that's that's how it works it's only ever been one uh, presidential election has gone to the second round in Russia which was in 96 because Putin won all the others and you know how he won so uh, by the same method as these banks got these shares for its mate, their mates, by disqualifying anybody else. Curious that one. So, um, what what were the long term effects? So uh, clearly, this was a bit fraudulent to say the least. And so, what would happen now is the asset stripping phase. So, uh, when you've got these assets which belong to these companies, there's a risk that uh, the, the state may try and uh, take it back or something like this, or questions may be asked about how this money came into the hands of these, this group of oligarchs. So then the state, um, well, you can see the problem. So any, many of these people then try to strip the assets and send them abroad. Now, one of the assets you've always got within any company is cash. And uh, the, the, in most con com countries, using the cash of the company to buy the company is illegal. Um, 
I've got to make that quite clear. Supposing you want to buy a company and it's got in its uh, um, uh, kitty, uh, in its cash reserve, say, whatever, it's got uh, 5 million euros in its cash reserve and the company comes up for 6 million euros, you can't use that 5 million which is, which is bought and putting in a million of your own in to buy it. But that has happened in the past. I mean, it's not, it, it wasn't illegal in many, including here in Poland, it only became illegal or, towards the end of the 1990s. So, um, so that, that, that was one, what, that's one asset. Uh, if, if it's, for example, something like this nickel company, Norilsk Nickel, for example, if the, uh, I mean, the nickel's just lying in the, it, it's in the ground, or it might, be, it, it might be outside waiting for exports, there's cash coming in for it all the time, so therefore it's, that, that there's this cash, and this is partially what happens. This money here is cash. It's, it's then siphoned off and sent elsewhere. So it's sent off to the Cayman Islands or to Gibraltar or to some other British island or some other place where um, it's not going to be of much use to uh, the company or, or the Russian taxpayer, but it will serve the benefit of the oligarch. So the uh, asset stripping part is a really important uh, feature of this. Now, one of these um, oligarchs, Mikhail Khodorovsky, he attempted... Uh, later to make his company, UCOS, um, uh, transparent and a, uh, conforming to Western styles of uh, corporate governance. And for that, he got, ten, he got his company taken off him and um, 10 years imprisonment. So uh, it's very much in the benefit of the current leadership in Russia that this type of Capitalism, crony capitalism, continues to exist. It's not in the benefit of the Russian taxpayer. And I mean, certainly, I would have thought that even even 26 years after uh, the events of these cash for shares schemes, that uh, some of it could be clawed back. Now, under Putin, some comp the state did begin to claw some of it back, but of course, paying now market value for the companies. So uh, that, that allowed huge financial benefits. Now, according to Boris Berezovsky, who is no longer alive, and he was one of the uh, uh, original oligarchs, he says that, uh, he said, so he, he died in 2013, um, that part of the, uh, the pro each oligarch is actually holding for Putin part of the, uh, uh, his wealth. So if a oligarch, won't mention any names, but if an oligarch has got, let's say, 100, 100x, uh, then, then 20x of that is held uh, on account for Putin. So, uh, or, or, or whatever. And that is the way that Putin holds his cash. He hasn't just got a bank account it, uh, local bank with a large sum of cash uh, in it. Anyway, good. So that gives a little bit of background on where the oligarchs come from. Thank you, uh, thank you for watching this. Oh, I better tell you something about myself on this because obviously, I mean, I'm really interested in history. But I used to actually run a business magazine, so I have a vague idea on subjects of this nature. I've always maintained an uh, interest in economics and uh, finally actually some of the things recent things i was a witness to uh, i witnessed to, i wasn't an eyewitness to these auctions because they didn't invite me but uh, in other films however i shall tell you something about things i was invited to so thanks for watching and all the best from me in poland